inspired by the historical encounter between St. Francis and the Sultan al-Malik al kamil in 1219, the Center for Arab and Islamic Studies seeks to promote an understanding of Arab and Islamic cultures and appreciation of both their historical and contemporary significance in the global community and respectful relations between Muslims and Christians. Along with Dr. Baba Miko, Director of the Diversity Action Committee, I'm very happy to welcome you to this evening's special event, a talk by Dr. John Esposito. For the past week at St. Bonaventure, we've been celebrating Francis Week, commemorating the life and legacy of St. Francis, a life and legacy that is perpetuated by Franciscan brothers and sisters, by Franciscan institutions, by their faculty, students, and staff, as well as by a Jesuit pope who took the name of Francis. Speaking recently in Assisi, Pope Francis spoke of peace, and this is how he described peace. Peace means forgiveness, the fruit of conversion and prayer that is born from within, and that in God's name makes it possible to heal old wounds. Peace means welcome, openness to dialogue, the overcoming of closed-mindedness, which is not a strategy for safety, but rather a bridge over an empty space. Peace means cooperation, a concrete and active exchange with another who is a gift and not a problem, a brother or sister with whom to build a better world. Peace denotes education, a call to learn every day the challenging art of communion, to acquire a culture of encounter, purifying the conscience of every temptation to violence and stubbornness that is contrary to the name of human dignity. I can think of no better person to bring our celebration of Francis Week to a conclusion than Dr. John Esposito. For several decades now, he has been at the forefront of American scholarship in Islamic studies. If I were to give you a complete list of his credentials and contributions, there would be very little time for him to speak. So I'll give you just the highlights. <laughs> Dr. Esposito is University Professor, Professor of Religion and International Affairs and of Islamic Studies at Georgetown University. He is Founding Director of the Al-Walid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding in the School of Foreign Service, Georgetown. Project Director of Georgetown's Bridge Initiative. Previously, he was Loyola Professor of Middle East Studies College of the Holy Cross. He is past president of the American Academy of Religion and Middle East Studies Association of North America. He has served as a consultant to the U.S. <coughs> Department of State, European and Asian governments, corporations, universities, and media worldwide, and ambassador for the UN Alliance of Civilizations. These are the highlights. He was a member of the World Economic Forum's Council of 100 Leaders and the European Network of Experts on De-Radicalization. He has received numerous honorary doctorates from universities both in the U.S. and worldwide. He has more than 45 books on nearly every aspect of Islam, including The Future of Islam, Islamophobia and the Challenge of Pluralism in the 21st Century, Who Speaks for Islam, What a Billion Muslims Really Think, Unholy War, Terror in the Name of Islam, The Islamic Threat, Myth or Reality, Islam in Politics, What Everyone Needs to Know About Islam, Asian Islam in the 21st Century, Islam, Gender and Social Change, and Women, 
in Muslim family law, so you can see the breadth of his expertise. His books and numerous articles have been translated into more than 35 languages. He is editor-in-chief of Oxford Islamic Studies Online and series editor of the Oxford Library of Islamic Studies. He has also served as editor-in-chief of the Oxford Encyclopedia of the Islamic World, the Oxford History of Islam, the Oxford Dictionary of Islam, and the Islamic World Past and Present. Dr. Esposito's interviews and articles with newspapers, magazines, and the media in, U in the US, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and on and on. He is a native of Brooklyn, New York, which is why we get along so well. <laughs> Two Italians, Brooklyn, you got the connection. Perhaps more than anything now, he is a mentor, a colleague, and a good friend. He is truly a man of peace. Please help me in welcoming Dr. John Esposito. Serious. It's just a very, a very bad cold or virus, so I won't have the usual energy that I have. <clears throat> in any case, let me begin. I want to talk about um, Islam and the challenge of pluralism in the 21st century. There are 2.3 billion Christians in the world, 1.6 billion Muslims, 1.1 billion Hindus, 500 million Buddhists. 14 million Jews, and 23 million Sikhs. That's the context within which one can then say that Islam is the second largest religion in the world. Uh, there are more Muslims in the last year or two, the statistics show that there are more Muslims than there are Catholics in the world. And that statement comes out of the Vatican, so. Uh, the fact that they would say that, I think that speaks for itself. I happen to have the best job in the world, which is true. Um, for 40 years, people ask me the same questions. Is Islam a particularly violent religion? Uh, is Islam compatible with democracy? What about women in Islam? And we seem to have a learning curve dealing with that. So some of those things I'm going to de deal with today. But for you to understand Islam and American attitudes towards Islam, it's important to realize that it was not until the Iranian Revolution that Islam became part of our consciousness in America. Uh, when I grew up in Brooklyn, there were no mosques. Uh, there, there were Muslims in the United States, but they weren't really known as Muslims. Somebody would have said, oh, that person's Lebanese or Syrian or whatever. There was no consciousness of that. Um, there was a, th a theory in which a modernization and development that said if you want to become modern, okay, then you have to become westernized and secularized. And it's one uh, social scientist said, Muslims have a choice between Mecca and Meccanization. And whether or not they choose that will determine how they develop. Religion was seen as a, 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 a relic of the past and an obstacle in development. What did that really mean? It meant that Islam was not taught in our schools and universities. It meant that uh, foreign diplomats, military, um, you name it, business people uh, going to the Muslim uh, world didn't feel any need to know anything about the religion or the culture. We were just going to be our American selves or our European selves, whoever we were. It meant that professional organizations like the American Academy of Religion, which is an, which is an organization for, for all the religions in the world, did not have a section on Islam. It was basically the American Academy of Religion in its early days were basically Protestants, and then Protestants and some Catholics. So it was you know, it was Christianity in that form, then Judaism, but until 1980 or so, Islam was not visible there. It was not visible at the Middle East Studies Association, the largest Middle East group in the world. Because again, the attitude was, 
Okay, we'll cover Islam when we're studying the early centuries, but it's not relevant to the modern period. You can see it clearly in books on Islam, introductions, so only a few. And if you looked at the back, the entire 19th and 20th century was covered in 15 pages. What would that say to a student or a reader? Nothing's really happened or happening there. Okay. All of that was there. Let me begin also and preface it with, uh, I think I was supposed to put on those mics. Uh, hold on a second. I tend to walk if I speak, so. <coughs> yeah, they were sort of testing me, so I don't know if this is all right. One of the things you have to realize when we talk about um, one of the things you have to okay, one of the things you have to remember when we talk about religion in any context is that religion has a transcendent and a dark side. Whether we're talking about Protestantism, Catholicism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Sikhism, etc. That is, all of these traditions have a belief in a transcendent reality, and that that reality can be experienced. That that reality is beyond us, but for many of the religions, that reality also dwells within us. Okay? That's the way we like to think about religion, but all religions have a dark side. I'm teaching a course on religion and violence, and let me tell you, the blood flowed historically in the past as it is today, often done in the name of religion. Very often, the primary drivers are political and economic considerations, but when it comes to identity and confronting somebody or legitimating and mobilizing, well, then you appeal to religion. It was not uncommon, for example, in past world wars for chaplains to say, we're going to win because we're, we're on God's side. So chaplains might say that in Britain and America during World War II, the chaplains were saying the same thing in Germany. So we've got the transcendent and the dark side. And when we deal with religion, we should compare our ideal to the other's ideal, and our realities to the other realities. Actually, what we tend to do is we compare our ideal to other people's realities. You know, so that's the difference. Katie Carrick uh, uh, on uh, after 9-11 on uh, the morning news show, interviewed a Muslim. And at the end of it, she said, oh, I get it. She said, uh, uh, in your religion, you can fight and, and kill the, uh, the opponent. In my religion, we're to, uh, trained to turn the, the other cheek. To which I responded, watching TV with my wife, I jumped up and said, slap her, slap her in the face. <laughs> because if he had done that, the camera crew would have come, they would have grabbed him physically, pulled, you know, pulled him out, she would have turned, she, and if he had taken her fur coat and said, well, Jesus said, you know, somebody wants your tunic, so give it to them, etc. So we have that way of doing it. You know, we look at and we say things like, why is Islam such a violent religion? <clears throat> You start looking at Christianity from the third century on, and are we kidding? The Crusades, the Inquisition, European colonialism, uh, and you can, you can go right down, right down the ladder. The fact is that when we declared victory in Iraq, which wasn't a victory, when George Bush declared it, immediately missionaries ran to Iraq to convert people. Which is a double insult, because you go to Iraq to convert Muslims, because you're going to save their souls, but you're also going to convert Christians that live in Iraq, and whose history dates way back to Jesus, when in fact these groups came into existence in the late 19th and early 20th century. They're basically Protestant Islamic fundamentalists, Protestant Islamic fundamentalists, Protestant fundamentalists, you know, very conservative. So, I want to say that by way of background as I get into uh, what I'll be talking about tonight. When then did we encounter Iran? We encountered uh, uh, Islam during the Iranian Revolution. Tom Brokaw, again on the morning news, when the hostages were taken, he stopped the news to say, let me tell you something about Islam. Islam is the second largest of the world's religions. It has a scripture called the Quran and a prophet named Muhammad. Full stop. Note what he just said. 
three of the most basic things in the world. If any of us were traveling in another part of the world and somebody said they didn't know the name Jesus and they didn't recognize the word Bible, we'd say, they're dumb. Here we were in America, which, in which we feel we have a good educational system, and Brokaw was basically saying, I have to tell people this very, very basic kind of stuff, even to get a sense of you know, what it's about. And Barry Serafin, who used to be the reporter at the gate talking to Miriam, who was the spokesperson uh, for the, the, the hostage takers, she began with the Salahi Rahman Rahim, in the name of God, the merciful and the compassionate, and then she began to quote some of the Quran on the day, or, or something from the Hadith, the, the stories about the Prophet. And here we're worried about our hostages, and he, in effect, by about the second time he interviewed, he said, could you move on? In other words, you know, after you do the Bismillahi, instead of getting into this little thing that you're going to do in Arabic or Persian, could you move on? For Americans who knew nothing about Islam, their encounter with Islam was putting the TV on and seeing people in the street shouting death to America. And with that image, since we think TV shows us everything, it's sort of like the belief is, oh gee, it's four o'clock, I put my TV on, and we just, you know, whatever the time is in, in, in Iran, and everybody goes out into the street at the same time. All the Iranians go out and say death to America. That was the engagement with Islam. It's a little bit like in the old days when many of us were raised in ethnic neighborhoods. I was raised in an Italian ethnic neighborhood in Brooklyn, and the neighborhoods around me were all Italian. Um, when I engaged a person from an, another ethnic group, the tendency was I would generalize from that. I'd say, oh, that must be what Irish people are like, because I made one or two of them, you know? Uh, or, oh, oh, that must be what Italians are like. When I first brought my wife home to meet my parents, she came out, she's wearing a black dress, nothing, just completely black, hair pulled back very severely. Uh, she's blonde, blue eyes, and I married her for her mind, if I take it. Uh, which I noticed when she was walking away from me the first time. Uh, but in any case, um, she was unusually quiet with my parents, and after and I said, why, why do you dress this way? And, because the way she was dressed is the way we Italians mourn for you know, a month or two when somebody dies. Women wear black all the time. And basically, it was, she said, well, I didn't know what they'd be like. We've got an Italian family next door. They're loud. They can be crude. And I just kind of thought, that's the way it was. You know, it was a little bit like my, my grandmother used to say to me, uh, her children all married uh, other Italians except for my Uncle George. He married Aunt Kitty, who was Irish. And so when we have holidays, Aunt Kitty would drink beer and often drink too much beer. And Uncle George could drink a lot of scotch or wine. But if Aunt Kitty looked like she drank too much, my grandmother would say, that's what they're like. That's what they're like. You know? I mean, you know, you sort of you know, have that sense. So Islam, in a way, started out Nowhere. When I said I was going to teach Islam, people said, you know, to get a job. And when I finished my degree in 1974, they were right. I was, I was hired because I could teach four world religions, not because I could teach Islam. There were no book contracts, there was nothing. It wasn't until the Iranian Revolution that brought me my career and quite literally my first Lexus. <laughs> Two of my nephews are finishing in the classics, and it's very hard to get jobs. And I sort of said to them, get an NEH brand, go to Greece, try to create some kind of <laughs> revolution, and uh, try to somehow segue yourself into translating texts that are related to the revolution. <laughs> so, so but that, that was the reality. And it's against, it's through that lens that we then saw, you get, that, that we saw Islam. It was the enemy. And remember, Khomeini talked about spreading, calling for a revolution in the Gulf where we have our oil allies, and even for a revolution globally. It was with that fear that this religion was seen. That's about the same as if you never met a, if you never met a Catholic and you came here and you read the newspapers 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and you read about the, pro the problems with pedophilia in the church. You know, it's like when people say they don't want a mosque near them because they're worried about them. I always say what we should do is when there's a new Catholic high school going up, we should go and say, we really don't want you in the neighborhood because we're concerned about pedophilia with our kids. That generalization. I, I know I have family members that believe that you know Catholics now are seen differently than they were before because people generalize from that you know that instance to something else. I, I get that by way of background because then I want to move into 
the main things that I want to leave you with today. What we see after Iran is suddenly seeing Islam as the enemy. Islam increasingly is seen as a triple threat. It's in our newspapers, but not that clearly. Really, it doesn't come across till 9 11. But it was in the newspapers, and it was in the statements uh, often that major thought leaders would be. What they would say is, well, it's been really, it's a triple threat. There have been 14 centuries of jihads. And 14 centuries of crusades? No. 14 centuries of jihad. It's a civilizational threat, and it's a demographic threat. The Muslims are coming, the Muslims are coming. Pat Buchanan wrote a piece, Pat Buchanan is Catholic, for those of you that don't know it, uh, and Georgetown Bible. <coughs> but Georgetown still has carried on. Uh, Pat wrote an article in which he basically said that Islam was a demographic threat in Europe. And the way he put it was as follows. In Germany, where Condon is king, showing you we graduated from Georgetown, because we know any good Catholic school has everything in the bookstore and little baby clothes, etc., but not condoms. So I was just a kid about that. We were going to put, when I was at the Crusade, at the Holy Cross, they always talked about the Crusaders, and I said, you know, there's a market for a kind of a crusader on it. I haven't seen it sort of blasphemy. All right. So what does Buchanan say? No, 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 it's logic. He says, in Europe where condom is king, showing his Catholic position, and it's the Europeans that become secular, you know, they're giving up religion. And so here's this Turkish doctor. He wasn't saying that the Turk was bad, but the Turkish doctor is performing abortions on, if you will, native or indigenous Germans. Therefore, you're going to have a small shrinking population while the Turkish doctor has six or eight children. So the demographic threat. And, and that gets spread around. People often ask, what's the population of Muslims in America? And there's, there's kind of a presumption that if you say there are, if I say to you there are five to six million Muslims, the average person will think, oh, that means five to six million people who pray five times a day. Simply not true. Muslims are like people of other faiths. There are people who pray five times a day, and there are people who don't. We have Easter Catholics, and you have Eid Muslims. That is, you know, the Muslim, certain Muslims come out for the big holidays, but it's not as if they're, they're going to go to mosque for Juma prayer, the congregational prayer on Friday. There's a kind of presumption, and, and that presumption, often when people make it and they link it, it's because they're really trying to say, wait a minute, how significant is this threat? All you need to do, and I'll touch on it uh, in, in a little while, is to look at our presidential elections from the first time Obama ran, 2008 to 2012, and now look at the elections now, and the extent to which Muslims have been put at the core of some of the candidates' uh, discussions. Newt Gingrich, Rick Santorum, um, Michelle Bachman of Happy Memory, um, and um, uh, Mr. Carson, uh, Mr. Trump, uh, etc. And I I'll touch on that a bit more. Okay, so. Now we've got Islam as a triple threat. Then 9-11 comes along. 9-11 just totally traumatized us as a, as a country. But remember, as terrible as 9-11 was, it was exponentially terrible, because I've had to explain this to people who live outside of America, and will say, in effect, with all due respect, it was a terrible thing that happened on 9-11, but you lost roughly 3,000 people. You know, in Nagasaki and Hiroshima account for 450,000 people, and we've had other huge, you know, disasters. But for us, the Americans, we were always used to engaging the enemy overseas and not at home. That level of vulnerability, the idea that you also hit the Twin Towers, which, which, which are the symbol of America's economy, as it were, if you will, uh, and you hit Washington, you hit the Pentagon, Okay? That had a certain kind of symbolism, and that's when things really started to take off. But where they began to really boil, and almost a comfortable boil, was in the elections of 2008 and 2012. 2008, you had to have Colin Powell say, what if President Obama were a Muslim? Why should that be an issue? And then remind people about a young Muslim soldier who had died, and was only one of many soldiers who had died. Just as there were Muslims who died in the Twin Towers, there were Muslims who were police and firemen and who were affected by, you know, what went on. None of that's on people's screens. For example, how many of you are aware of statements made by Muslims and that you've read in the newspapers denouncing terrorism? Would you raise your hand? Okay. That, that's a minority in the audience. 
When I speak, I, I'll head that question off. This way nobody will get up and ask, well, why don't they denounce terrorism more? On the internet, you have two point, at least 2.4 million statements of Muslim individuals and organizations since 9-11 who, when there are attacks, have spoken out, and you don't know them. Most of us don't see them. Why not? Because it's not reported in media. How many of you have heard of a common word between us and you? We have one, two, three, four hands. Okay. Very intelligent. Must be Democrats this election time. Nope, sorry. Um, how many of you have heard of the Amman, as in Amman Jordan message? Two. One, two. How many of you have heard of the Marrakesh Declaration? Hand up. Oh, okay. Nobody. I rest my face. Um, you can ask me during, during the uh, Q&A what they were about. These are major international uh, messages put out by Muslims, by major Christian leaders, etc. I, I did the Iman message in Washington, you know, the, 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 the launch, etc. And it, it just doesn't, it doesn't get taken in. Why? Because for me, for media, if it bleeds, it bleeds. And, and so when you now have people just, see, it's, it's better to cover Baghdadi and what he's done on Tuesday than to cover the fact that 300 major Muslim leaders joined with the Pope, the Archbishop of Canterbury, etc., and drafted a statement about what we share in common as we face this, this world which is so turbulent, for example. And as a result, often people will say, I mean, I, I, I since this is being videotaped, I have to remember that. Though. I have known very intelligent people, I almost identified them, you know, it's like, I was about ready to say something like, my physician is very bright, does X, I'm not, and I'm not talking about my physician right now. Okay. But I have known really bright people, professionals in D.C., very cosmopolitan, who say the following thing to me. One of them, I, I discussed Islam with him a couple of times. He said uh, something about Muslims, and he said, oh, John, you know, you've helped me understand. That I shouldn't generalize about this. There's a diversity of Muslims. He said, he said, so really what I should say is, when are they going to get their imams to tell the Muslims that the Quran doesn't say you should kill all Jews and Christians? I looked at him. Another one who has a Middle East background, another, another fellow with a Middle East background, who holds advanced degrees, said, you know, when are they ever going to denounce terrorism? And, and these are very bright people, because when they get their news, they're busy professionals, they put their TV screen on, and the only thing they see are these attacks. As long as we're going to do that, let's forget about the paper that I was going to give you. I'll pull off some stuff from there. Let's take a look at media. From 2001 to 2011, 975,000 um, pieces of media, mass media, okay? Uh, this is from uh, studies done of European and American newspapers. They look at 975,000 pieces of media and say, in all this media, where do we find Islam and Muslims? How are they portrayed? 2001, they found that 2% focused on extremism, 0.1% on the broader context. The vast number of Muslims in the world, their accomplishments, their Nobels, their you know, Islam, etc. 2% versus 0.1%. 2011, the 2% jumps to 25%. So we say, well, there were things going on. You know, 25%. And the context, the other side, remains at 0.1%. Think about that disparity then. If your news is coming, if you've never met a Muslim in your life, more than 50% of Americans say they've never met a Muslim in their life, more than 50% of Americans have said consistently that they know nothing about Islam, and, and your media coverage is that 25% in the media is the, when they go to deal with Islam. All you see are the extremist attacks, and then 0.1%. Okay. Especially when you consider, although they're deadly, the, the, the fact that it's a, it's a, it's a fraction of 1% of the world's Muslims that have been engaged in this kind of violence. Even a group like ISIS is never reported to have more than 20 or 30,000 members, and that's at a large number. Al-Qaeda has much less. But what makes them dangerous is their acts of terrorism. Now, the latest study shows, 
The latest study shows that 90% of the reports are negative. A study of the US, uh, UK, and Germany found that nine out of 10 stories were about extremism. extremism. Those about mainstream Islam, more than 50% were extremists. And when they wrote little like bios and vignettes about who are Muslims in the world today, they didn't write about Nobel winners. They didn't write about great entrepreneurs. The overwhelming coverage of individuals is basically of warlords and terrorists. So that's what we're, we're pulling in. It's with those images that we're not able to get at the heart of who the Muslims are and what they, what they believe and then what American Muslims, uh, where American Muslims are in this whole thing. For Muslims, getting to understand Islam very briefly, for Muslims, Islam is a spiritual path that gives meaning. It's a way of life, and that's important. And in fact, that's true historically for all faiths. It's a way of life. <coughs> Many of us in modern times, even if we remain faithful, have compartmentalized our lives. I remember, you know, Mr. Buckley, and most of you would, would know him, but he's a famous uh, intellectual, very, very conservative, Bill Buckley, um, and not Bill Buckley. Uh, <laughs> No, that's him. No, that's him. Right. I had a friend named Buckley also, and I thought I was confusing that. Okay. Bill Buckley was a very conservative Catholic, a very devoted Catholic, but also a very successful um, uh, newspaper columnist, also uh, a major voice uh, among conservative Republicans in terms of publications, etc. Devout Catholic, okay? And then the Pope came along with an encyclical called Mater et Magister, Mother and Teacher. And Buckley said, Matra C, Magistra no. And the whole idea was the Pope's now speaking out in an area he would have been absolute on, on things of Mary's, uh, Mary's ascension into heaven, etc., uh, in terms of the infallibility of the Pope. But when he spoke on these economic issues and it went against his political view, it was Matra C, Magistra no. <coughs> so, a way of life, an integrated way of life. We start out with that, that first part. Although 65% of Americans acknowledge the importance of religion in their lives, 80% of Muslims acknowledge. So there is a disparity there. 65% okay, of Americans say religion is important in their lives, 80% of Americans uh, say uh, that it's important. The overwhelming number of Muslims globally will say that religion is necessary in their society, and in their lives. Majorities of respondents in countries with substantial or predominantly Muslim populations report that religion is an integral part of their daily lives. 100% of the people in Egypt, 99% of the people in Indonesia, 99% of the people in Bangladesh, 98% in Morocco. But who are these Muslims? What do they believe and how do they connect with many of us? Not all of us, but many of us. In America, post-World War II, we began to talk about it and, and talk about a Judeo-Christian tradition. That never existed in the past. Why? Because historically, Christians were guilty of anti-Semitism for a good deal of the time. So it wasn't as if Christians before World War II were saying there's a Judeo-Christian tradition. Popes weren't saying it, etc. It was actually the Holocaust was a wake-up call. They didn't acknowledge that. But what we, what we did say was that there's a Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition. I mean, one of the questions about, in terms of myself, you know, why did I study Islam? I didn't go to Temple University to get a PhD in Islam. I was a theologian at the time of Vatican II with a master's degree going to get a PhD. Temple University had a religion program where I could go to a secular university because I wanted to get see another side. I had a, a total Catholic education all my life. I could get a doctorate in Catholicism within. I never got to take a course in Catholicism because I became fascinated with world religions and started studying Hinduism and Buddhism and then was ready to do a, a degree in Hinduism. I had a wonderful uh, Indian professor who was so nice that he said my term paper could be turned into a dissertation. I thought I'd kiss him on both cheeks and fall on my knees. Here I'm this young guy married teaching four courses a semester and this guy says I can fast track. I go to the chairman and he says, you should take a course on Islam. And I said, I'm really busy, I don't want to. 
He was pressing me and pressing me because we were fi fi uh, you know, finally hiring a Muslim. And I took that one course with the idea that that would be it. And it just, suddenly I discovered, why is Islam cool with Hinduism and Buddhism and Confucianism? I didn't know what Islam was, but why is it over there? When in fact is a Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition? Why do I say that? Because Muslims, like Jews and Christians, recognize the revelation to Abraham and to all the great biblical prophets. Jesus is mentioned more in the Quran than Muhammad. Mary is mentioned more in the Quran than in the New Testament. Muslim names are Jesus, Moses, and Mary. Isa for Jesus. Musa for Moses. Maryam for Mary. And Yaqub for Jacob, etc., etc. So you have the that recognition. Muslims accept the fact that God revealed the Torah to Moses and that God revealed the Gospels to Jesus. What Muslims also believe, though, is that these scriptures became corrupted. For example, the impact of Greek thought then had Jesus go from being a great prophet to a God-man, if you will, the divine. Um, and so there's that sense that of a corruption, and therefore the revelation has to come one more time. Now, Christians have that notion, right? We, we, we look at the Bible, we refer to, right, the Old Testament versus the New Testament. And we tend to see that, therefore, a new covenant came, and a new prophet and son of God came. Okay? So for Muslims, God in his mercy revealed, sent his revelation one final time, and that is the Quran which is seen as the literal, the very word of God. When I say literal, I don't mean literalist. It means it's the very word of God, okay? Uh, revealed to Muhammad. All right. From an early age, the vision that children have when they grow up of God is as follows. That God is merciful and compassionate, but also a just judge. Therefore, God is to be loved, but also fear if we are bad people, over, overwhelmingly bad people. But if you want to get a sense of how Muslims see God as compassionate and merciful, think about the fact that every verse of the Quran begins with Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the merciful and compassionate. Uh, a, a, a traditionalist Muslim will begin a letter with that phrase in Arabic, you know, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim will begin a speech when they start to drive the car. When I picked up on that, I started to get nervous. I mean, he had our St. Christopher medal, but when I'd be with my Muslim friends and they'd start, you know, I, I could hear them whispering to themselves very low. I said, oh, wait a second. And if you've ever been in a car in Egypt, you know what I mean. <laughs> it, makes, it makes driving in Italy look like a piece of candy. <laughs> um, in fact, I was with a Muslim in India, a very prominent Muslim. Uh, Siraj Wahad, she's based out of New York. And we went to a gathering where we spoke 200,000, no, 250,000 Muslims were there. That's when I decided, dating myself, that I was a Mick Jagger of my profession. <laughs> Nothing great in going to an audience of 250,000. I mean, it's like, after that, it's a come down, you know, coming back to the real world. But we were in a car, and in, in India, it was like unbelievable, unbelievable day. And I'm in the front, and I'm just, I just sort of relax. It's not that I'm not a person who gets nervous, you just decide, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, and what am I going to do? And he, who's this man who, you know, live, has lived in tough neighborhoods, etc., the guy, the driver said, because I kept saying, take it easy so much, don't worry about it. The driver kept saying, he's been a nervous wreck the whole week, would you get him to please relax? Okay. So, Muslims, therefore, grow up hearing that God is merciful and compassionate. And if they pray every day, they say it up to you times. Well, they're not stupid, stupid. You know, I mean, in fact, you're going to then say, God is merciful and compassionate. You know? But there's also that notion of just judgment. It's important to get that out there, because the image that many, many people have is that God is simply a God of vengeance. Now, think about the fact that we don't contextualize, we do contextualize when we Christians look at the Bible. Because if we didn't, think about all the wars in the Old Testament. I did a, an interview with a guy in New York, uh, and who happened to be Jewish, the reason I'm saying that, you'll know from where my example comes out. 
At one point he was talking about Islam and Muhammad, and he said, well, what do you expect? The prophet was a warrior. I said, well, how about the Old Testament? Well, I don't know about that. I really didn't even talk about it. That's not what the show is about today. I said, how about Joshua and David, etc.? You know, I mean, the, in the Old Testament, which is part of our, our Bible, those of us that are, are Christian, God commands genocide in a number of places. Okay? That's the only religious scripture in, in which that occurs. But we contextualize that. And then, and then we go from there. You know? um, I do the comparative just so that I can keep, keep us uh, you know, uh, uh, fair in, in, in our judgments. Uh, that does not, mean it, does not mean that there aren't extremists who in the name of their faith and cite their scriptures to justify what they do. What do you think the Ku Klux Klan did? I mean, what do you think people did when we had the Inquisition or the Crusades? Pope Urban said, God wills it. Did God appear when we say God wills it? It was a highly politically motivated, as well as religiously motivated, war. So scriptures are appropriated by people to legitimate. People that walk into abortion clinics and bomb it, or, you know, wind up killing people. Many, some of them are advised by pastors. Some of them are pastors. This happens. Settlers on the West Bank who are religiously driven, will make claims to land and commit acts of terror. As will extremist Muslims in Palestine create their actions. And the mainstream will disassociate themselves. So, one wants to tease that out and see it. For Muslims, the Quran says that Christians and Jews are people of the book. Muslims also have a sense of community that's similar to many other faiths. That is, the sense is not only that I belong to a faith as a believer, and I'm in this local community, but I belong to a transnational faith. In the old days, the Catholics, that meant you could go to the Mass any place, and it was in Latin in order to hold on to that. For Muslims, it's Arabic, and it's still held that way. All Muslims, even if one doesn't read or speak Arabic, learn how to pray in Arabic, because the faith is seen as um, as a universal faith. Now, therefore, where did the contestation and clashes occur in the past? Well, they, they occurred for two reasons. One, when Islam came with the claim that Muhammad was the final revelation, the Quran was the final revelation, that is, Muhammad you know, was the final bearer of revelation, that's what Christians said via Judaism, but of course Christians didn't appreciate that. Also, Muslims believed, like Christians, the early Christians, that their faith was a universal faith and their mission was to convert everyone. So, therefore, you have a theological tension and then you have the imperial. That is, when you have Christendom emerging and you have an Islam that is also now empires as well, now you've got Christendom, you've got empire to empire, so then you have political contestation and political threat. But what it covers over are the many experiences uh, during that period where Christians actually um, um, and Muslims were living side by side and working together. And indeed, in, in some of the wars that took place during the Crusades, uh, you would have um, um, Christians excuse me, I have to get some water. I'm taking a pill that drives your mouth out. Um, and it really does. My physician was correct. <laughs> tell, me, tell me what it's like it's on the top of my paddle. Okay. Um, so, but the question is, if we are creating a more just society religiously, as indeed both Christians and Muslims believe, for Muslims the question is, how does this begin? The first question that most of us faced was, okay, how do I know God's will and how do I follow? What does God want me to do? This led to the development of Sharia. Uh, and this will sound a little academic -y, but it's really important because all you hear when people want to, uh, in the last 10 years, in their bashing is Sharia. They're going to impose Sharia. We have something like 30 states that have tried to pass legislation, anti-Sharia laws, when nobody has talked about implementing Sharia. It's like, I guess, a preemptive strike or something. You know? um, uh, and, and the irony is that Sharia means 
that you, for example, pray five times a day, that's part of Sharia. That you fast during Ramadan, that's part of Sharia. So Sharia is God's will as revealed in the Quran. Okay? And then it develops as Islamic law when human beings look to the Quran and either pull stuff out that's directly there, or in light of its principles and values, define what a good Muslim should look like in the 4th century or the 9th century. Therefore, while Sharia is divine, Islamic law is a product of the divine and human. And so Islamic law, to the extent that some of its laws are medieval, need to be reinterpreted. For very conservative Muslims, they would rather hold much more conservatively to that law and not risk throwing the baby out with the bathroom. Okay. Uh, for progressives, they believe you go to the principles and values of your scripture, but to the extent that it does not uh, meet the needs of, of the 20th century, uh, to the extent that we're no longer living in a patriarchal society, that you want to define, let's say, the, the, the role of uh, men and women, or you want to have reforms in marriage regulations, etc. Okay. For the extremists, the extremists will take the scripture to simply justify what they want. Let me give you an example. Some of you have heard this. When a lot of people ask the question and they say, this is what Islam is about. They say, the Quran says, slay the unbelievers wherever you find them. If you don't contextualize it, then you won't understand the text. The people that the Quran was speaking about were the Meccan pagans who were attacking the Muslims. And so the Quran says, they're attacking you, you have a right, they're killing you, you have a right to fight back. They don't bother, the people who bring this up don't bother to continue the verse, because at the end of the verse it says, well, when they desist from doing that, you have to desist. Which brings you to the notion of jihad. Jihad for Muslims is the struggle to follow Islam. We all are engaged in a jihad, those of us that are believers, or those of us that are not, but are ethical. Our jihad or our struggle is to be a good person, to follow those principles and values that we believe in. Yeah. So that's the basic thing for a Muslim, uh, that one should strive to follow God's path. Part of that jihad also, though, is if the community is under siege, you have a right to resist. So it's not turn the other cheek. It's you have a right to resist. That's a defense. But it was also used by emperors to justify wars of aggression. Just as in imperial Christianity, the emperor used it to legitimate his rule and to justify what they were doing. Okay? And in modern times, it's used by extremists to legitimate what they want to do. A concrete example of this is to go and look at uh, the first speech that bin Laden gave in an interview on CNN. The first couple of pages, if you saw the text, would be about grievances that are very common. Uh, the Crusades, neo-colonialism, and now American colonialism. You know, uh, you, know, that, uh, uh, you know, the grievances of supporting authoritarian regimes, which then leads to the oppression of Muslims, etc. Political. But when he goes to legitimate and mobilize, then he goes to theology and to religion. And then he, then he, he cherry-picks his passages, and when he cherry-picks his passages, he doesn't contextualize it. So therefore, what he's saying is, look, the Quran says, slay the unbelievers wherever you find them. That legitimates fighting Jews and Christians. Today. Yeah? I mean, just puts it you know, right out that way. So, unless we see that, unless we see the way that term is used, we're not going to be able to understand Islam. And again, this is not to deny the fact that there are extremists and terrorists, and who do this in the name of their religion. But we need to put it, I think, in uh, perspective. Um, the, um, I'm sorry, uh, my brain is not working. Well, it's working, obviously, but it's not working. Um, <laughs> it's probably the worst time I've had in 40 years in terms of my mind going on. Okay, um, so let me talk a little bit about the Quran and how it talks about people in the world. The Quran affirms God's decision to create not just a single nation, so God did not say I'm creating a single nation, it's a Muslim nation, and then there's the rest of the world. In fact, God says he could have done that, 
when in fact God chose to create a world of different nations, ethnicities, tribes, and languages. Only humankind, we have created you male and female, and made you nations and tribes, so that you might come to know each other, and so that you, it, tribes, so that you might come to know, to know each other. The Quran's recognition of the human community's religious diversity is stated as follows. To everyone we have appointed a way and a course to follow. In other words, to Jews, to Christians, and to Muslims, there is a way and a course to follow. For each there is a direction to which he turns when they pray, Jerusalem, Mecca. Vie therefore with one another in the performance of good works. Wherever you may be, God shall bring you all together on the day of judgment. Surely God has power over all things. With regard to Jews and Christians, they not only refer to his people in the book, but the Quran states very clearly there is to be no compulsion in Islam. Well, why would we think that there is compulsion in Islam? Because we see extremists and terrorists that clearly, you know, uh, espouse this. We see extremist preachers that, that espouse this, etc. But the point is, this is an aberration. It's as aberrant as when you have Christians and Jews using their faith to legitimate not only their warfare, but they legitimate the marginalization of others. Uh, I have uh, you know, many good friends who are very conservative Catholics. And I happen to be telling one of them about the uh, Filipino priest who um, officiated at the, uh, the uh, funeral of both my mother and my father. And when I was thanking him uh, after the uh, officiating at my father's funeral, my mother passed away before him, um, he got talking about what I did, and he seemed interested. And I just sort of wondered, I said, well, um, if you like, I can send you, I have some videos, like, I did a, a series, a video series for a teaching company on, on Islam. And he said, oh, I'd love to get it. And I said, well, you know, I'm kind of surprised in a way, uh, you know, given who you are and the culture that you're coming now. And he said, well, he said, oh, we have two priests in my immediate family, his brother, and my sisters are not. You can imagine how my parents felt when my brother came home and asked me as a Muslim. So I'm really interested. So I told that story to a very close uh, friend of mine, and to which he responded as follows. That's really nice, John. And we would also hope that he would pray for it this world so. And pray for it. Yeah. That's where you wind up with an issue. Now, people may want to believe that, but that's a very dangerous place to go. Because when you do that, pray for that immortal soul. When you take that approach, it's the equivalent of saying if you're not born again, you're going to hell. You may be a nice person, you may be mean well, but you're going to go to hell. Once you do that, and you create that other, it's not only a theological problem, you are so other in the other, that then all kinds of other things are possible. Believing all kinds of things that are said, uh, characterizing people, you know, uh, over-characterizing them in a, in a dangerous way. And that's part of the problem that we often have today. The clearest thing is if you put your television on and see John Hayden, the, the, uh, the minister and watch his show. Um, he also writes books. He's very anti-Muslim, very anti-Islam. And indeed, Muslims have reached out to him. He hasn't, uh, he hasn't been willing to, uh, to even see him. Okay, so if that's all true, or if this is the way I'm talking about Islam, then what about American Muslims? Because most of the time they're reading about Muslims overseas. What can we say about American Muslims? American Muslims are integrated into American society, educationally, economically, socially, and increasingly politically, and certainly religiously. What does that mean concretely? The poll done, oh, probably seven years ago. So this data goes back at least seven years by the Gallup organization. I was associated with Gallup, so you should be aware of that. 40% uh, of Muslims have college degrees versus 29% of Americans overall. Muslims, uh, as religious communities go, Muslims are second to American Jews in terms of level of education. And that's true for women, statistically, as uh, Muslim women are as educated as Muslim men. And also in the professions. St uh, of course, they're limited professions. Good Muslim boy becomes a doctor. Yeah, maybe an engineer, possibly a lawyer, and then where you go from here, traditionally. I remember once uh, having two physicians, a husband and wife, invited me to speak in Kansas, and 
the mother might have taught me about her son. Her son was brilliant, went to medical school, and wanted to write novels. I was going to give up medical school. And I said, let me guess. He said, she said, why can't you go to medical school and you'll get him around to teach him the Quran on weekends? He's like, you know, these are what the professions are. Okay, so educationally, and if you look at the kinds of professions, you've got lots of doctors. The Pakistani doctors organization is probably the largest in this country, for example, just Pakistanis. Um, um, across the professions, and they uh, and, and into blue collar jobs and driving cars. There's a, a guy who drove a limo in Pakistan, and he said to me one day, he said, you know, Professor, a lot of people say that we uh, Muslim men um, you know, really kind of marginalize our wives and don't want them to do work. So let me tell you about my situation. So I drive a car here and I go home for three or four months in the summertime. I make enough money. My wife wants to come to America. And I keep saying to her, if you stay in Pakistan, you can have a house, you can have a servant, etc. What I'm making is not going to happen in the United States. So I said, what happened? So she came here. He said, and every day I say to him, why don't you go out and get a job? Why don't you go out and get a job? I said, well, why are you saying that? He said, we have a small apartment. She's driving me crazy. So, <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting interpretation of uh, liberation. Um, okay, what else do we say about this in terms of professionally, 70% have a job compared to 64% of Americans overall. Among non-working people, the youth, 31% uh, of Muslims are students compared to 10% of Americans, overall other Americans, 31% compared to 10%. Religiously, how did Muslims come out in America? 77% said Muslims worship the same God as Christians and Jews. 84% said Muslims should strongly emphasize shared values with Christians and Jews. And with regard to the acid test of pluralism, Muslim scholar calls it the acid test of pluralism. The acid test of pluralism is you may know that you're going to be saved, but do you believe that other people can be saved in another religion? Uh, or is the elevator up to heaven? When you get out, are you going to say, oh wow, it's all going to be people of my religious group or my ethnic group? There'll be more Catholic Italians than that, but that's another story. <laughs> okay. The acid test, 33% said my religion is the one true faith we need to eternal life. 56% believe many religions can lead to eternal life. So it's, it's a different sense of where we really are. Now let me end with, 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 this, with this part to really put it in, into perspective. Why do we have this overwhelming situation? Why do we have a situation where major outfits report this year that, that Muslims are far and away the most uh, discriminated group and, and the most uh, a marginalized group relative to other groups. Um, and I would argue that it's both mass media and social media. We had a, a program with a reporters from the Washington Post and Newsweek, and somebody in the audience said, why do you only tell the negative stories? I understand you have to show that, but why do you have more sh shows? And you basically said, what media is into is conflict and conflict discourse. That's what sells newspapers. You know? I mean, Sean Hannity and O'Reilly, that style, but you can jump to MSNBC and you can deal depending on what your politics or your attitude, and you have Rachel Maddow, etc. That's what pulls people in. Then you have, if you watch NBC and CBS, particularly on Friday, the last five minutes, no matter all the people you're seeing getting killed all over the world and getting to watch it live, which is really lucky why you have it here, the last five minutes you'll have some nice story about some cute little kid or somebody who did a good, good, did a good deed. And it used to be that mass media drew, drove social media. In other words, social media would pick up from mass media. Now it's the reverse. More people look to social media. And so social media is the main driver. I'll give you an example of that. Um, I was asked to speak in a town outside of Dallas. It's on the periphery of Dallas. It's considered one of the of Dallas. And uh, five people were asked to speak. And Pamela Geller, anybody know the name Pamela Geller? She'd be upset and say, you would be good. Cool, Pamela. Oh, Pamela Geller is very visible on the social media circuit. So, uh, she has a number of websites. Uh, when you have the so-called mosque at ground zero issue, even though that it wasn't a mosque and it wasn't a ground zero, 
by the way. Uh, even though that was approved by all the officials, she and Outsider and other people like Robert Spencer mobilized and suddenly you had these major demonstrations. Then you had that minister in um, um, Gainesville, Florida, who, who, who had no more than about 25 followers who tried to sell his church, but threatened to burn the Quran. And then suddenly they worked off that and everything got kind of, 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 of whipped up. Um, when Gail heard about this, she got on Twitter and Facebook and called upon her people in the United States to show up. So we had hundreds of people, many of them from the outside, to the point where we had bodyguards, we had helicopters, we had FBI, we had SWAT teams, etc. It was like watching a movie. You know, I, I watch a lot of action movies. Uh, you know, you, you get stopped away and then Please come out and say, drive slowly, everybody gets in the way, hit the gas, and go to this police station. Then you get to the place, and you come in to a, a big place, and then it's clear in front of you. So you come in, it looks empty, and suddenly you see the SWAT team that appears, they check it out, and then you lead you into the next thing. So we had that kind of turnout. Um, and when Bill O'Reilly heard that that was happening, then the O'Reilly show called me, because I had done O'Reilly, and said, do you want to come on and talk about it? And I said, no, why don't you get a Muslim leader to come on? I'm organized. You know, I, you know, I've done your show. But that's when O'Reilly sent somebody down. To make a long story short, Gela didn't get her pound of flesh. She wasn't successful in terms of that program. That's why, in the same place, something like six months later, she held a meeting, and that's when they were doing the cartoons of the prophet. And that's when you had two guys come over from Arizona who were going to cause violence. So it's social media that's the driver. What we have is a social media that many of these, these people and organizations are interconnected. It's what we call it an, an organized Islamophobia network. That is, you have publications and blog sites that feed each other. So for example, I blog on a, on a, on a site. What it would mean then is that these people send that over to another place so that when you then see something, for example, if somebody attacks me on the internet, what will happen is within three days you'll see at least maybe five, eight stories under different names, the content that they say, and different organizations. So it'll be American thinking, for example. Family security, all sounds good. Um, pajama media sounds innocuous. But many of them are not just anti-Muslim. Some of them are very conservative, anti-immigrant, and anti-Muslim. So that network. And here's the big surprise. More than $200 million. Based on IRS returns to trace this, more than $200 million has gone to these people in these blog sites. So you think about the way that we go to social media, what you're going to get. Because remember the randomness of social media. My wife and I had a place in Florida, and we went to a lawyer to do a, 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 a will. And we really got along. And it, was, and it was very interesting because he basically was a very conservative Republican, but he had a problem with a big chain. By problem, I mean, he didn't like it. But we got talking. So we got along so well that when I was leaving, I turned to him, so I put it in back. He said, I'm fascinated with you. I said, and now I need to go to Google. Uh, I said, so you should know you're going to get the Google band in love. And, so, and when I came in, he said, Oh my God, it's, it's amazing, you know, because you've got all these really nice things, and then you've got somebody who says something, but it appears in five or six different places. Now, the downside is you are getting attacked, but I've decided that the upside is, suppose you're only getting a million people, and they're praising you, it's a million. We get another million to attack you, you can then say to people, what, oh, I have two million pieces. I must be important. That's okay. All right. So, the question is, when we think about how we move forward, to what extent are we going to do what, in fact, many Americans are doing, but not enough are, are, are really working on it. And that is, to figure out the ways in which we engage each other. They have interfaith groups, but it's got to go beyond interfaith groups. I happen to believe that it's changed from the law, not from the law. I think change from above is nice, but when you have, let's say, the Pope and leading leaders making statements, they get archived. And they get initial you know, coverage, but they get archived. 
I've been associated with UN uh, situations. It's a great report, and then it just goes on a shelf, and people forget it. Notice I said, I'm on message, etc. And these are all, by the way, messages that I asked you about. Uh, among messages when you have hundreds of religious leaders basically denouncing extremism and terrorism and setting out the criteria for why groups like Al Qaeda and then applying it to ISIS are not legitimate. I think the best way for us in our society to move forward is in our neighborhoods. That is, when you work with your neighbors on common issues, on issues of education, on issues of drugs, on issues, when you engage with somebody as a neighbor, without identifying necessarily them religiously, then when you get to know them and somebody comes along and says, did you know that Mary is a hardline evangelical and doesn't like X, Y, and Z? You want to say, I can't believe that she really thinks that way because I work with her. Uh, when you engage professionals in your work, you have lots of physicians and lawyers, that's where we build out. Training the next generation is why our schools and universities, unlike what I told you at the beginning of my talk, today Islam is taught in world religions courses across the country, it's taught in high schools, uh, we've got that kind of education. Uh, today we see more and more uh, occasions being created by people in communities to move the community forward so that they can accept as we have in the past, new religions and new ethnic groups. I'll end by reminding you that when ethnic Catholics came here, they were welcomed, but not as equals. We were seen as people who were good with, to work. We weren't seen as people who were going to go to Harvard or Yale. We weren't seen as people who were going to become corporate leaders. Um, you know, we were good, as I like to say, with Italians, we were seen as people who did with cement. We did construction and construction companies, and we buried people in cement. <laughs> <laughs> we, got, we had that, you know, that double. <laughs> now, Catholics are integrated into society. Uh, we probably have more wealth than white Anglo Saxon Protestants. Um, and that's accepted, but we could get in southern cities when they would string up blacks, they also would string up. Italians, because Italians were dark skin, many had come from the south, right? and that was the situation. As we move forward now, and it's important, we need to think about the way in which what our country is about, what our principles and values are about. If we let that go, if we suddenly target a particular religion or a particular group of people, and somehow they become the exception to the rule, it is a problem. If we go to change the rules of war, if we go to change the rules of how we interrogate people, if we go to change our domestic notion of civil liberties, then the America that we all share, its principles and values, will exist no more. Thank you. individual can be the author of 45 books. He just, it's, he's just spilling out all of his knowledge um, from decades of research and scholarship. Okay, um, now what we'd like to do is to have some Q&A. And my wonderful assistant, Zofania, here has Hi. a microphone. So if you have a question, I ask you to raise your hand. She will bring you the microphone. Now, I learned a lot of things at Georgetown, and I learned the Georgetown rules of Q&A. First of all, when you ask a question, please identify who you are by name and by affiliation, whether you're a student at Bonaventure, faculty member, community member, etc. And then please ask a question. Okay. Uh, and feel free to ask anything. I mean, I didn't get into issues of understanding global terrorism, ISIS, etc. Um, and I'll be brief in answering it, but I mean, feel free. I mean, you can't cover everything when you speak, and I don't know what an audience is 
questions on. Thank God we have one hand up, otherwise we have to meditate for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I use that in my class, actually. They really get quiet. I said, you want to do this and you want to meditate for 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Bob Donius, I, I teach here. Um, would you speak about how you would advise whoever is our next president with regard to ISIS and terrorism, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, this is a very complicated area. CVE is it. I'm terrible with acronyms, so combating violent extremism. That's the real issue. Governments, that's what they're concerned about. You want to catch government's attention. There are a lot of things governments will talk about. They're concerned about environment, et cetera. But CVE is a big thing. Um, and I actually did a series of lectures for the European Union, or uh, briefings and discussions, uh, and with a number of overseas governments. So I'm talking in terms of both the and others. Some of us would say that there's no successful CDE program. Nobody's developed a successful CDE program. The problem is that more often than not, the major study is done. For those of you who are students, uh, those of you who are students, there's a guy named Robert Pack, or Pate, P A P E who's done a definitive study of 20 years looking at suicide bombers across religions, okay? Uh, and, and if you go to the internet, you can get his article. His book's great, but the article is, you know, quintessential. And what he found was that overwhelmingly, the major drivers were political and economic, and particularly a sense of occupation, either the reality or a sense of occupation and domination. Whether it was the Tamil Tigers, uh, you know, in Sri Lanka, who actually were the first people to do suicide bombing, uh, or it was, you know, Buddhist and Hindu extremists, etc. So, the first thing you have to understand is the danger is that the quick fix, the easy quick fix is to say, hmm, let's win hearts and minds. And so the way you do that is, there's a problem, Islam needs to be fixed. In fact, the first lecture I gave in the EU, the person invited me said, I hope you don't mind, I'd like to rename the lecture to get more of my colleagues to show up and engage. How about if we say, how to fix Islam? Okay. Those who say, how to fix Islam. Yeah. Okay. But because the easy thing, the easiest thing would be, oh, if we can just get the religion thing out of the way, then the political and economic and the terrorism will disappear. Yeah. So if we can get a group of major religious leaders to make a statement, terrific. If we can get a lot of them to make a statement, terrific. Uh, if we can talk about madrasa or school reform, you know, be terrific. The fact is that in most cases, religion is a major force in terms of legitimating and recruiting. But the primary drivers are usually political and economic. So, for example, again, if you look at Bin Laden's first speech, he talks about the injustice is done. You know, uh, it refers to the Crusades. Uh, refers to neo European colonialism and then American policies, uh, refers to Palestine and Israel. I mean, you can think of all the things that, and then he goes for the religion. Why? Because he's looking to the mass audience. What we know from hard data, okay, uh, and from the, the Gallup World Polls, which were done over the largest, most systematic coverage of 35 countries, overwhelmingly, majorities of Muslims don't hate, you know. George Bush said they hate everything that we are, our democracy. The majority of Muslims admire America for its education, its technology, its freedoms, and its notions of governance. Majorities of Muslims want to see democracy, but don't believe they're going to get it. Why? Because they have authoritarian regimes. Why? Because those authoritarian regimes are propped up by the US and European powers. So, unless we address those, the underlying issues of Authoritarianism, corruption in countries, etc., it's going to go nowhere. And that's why that moment of light in the Arab Spring went dark, where you had an elected government in Egypt overthrown in a coup, rather than waiting for the elections to change the government. And so we still tend to with CDE, in a lot of contexts, think that it's the religion card. You know, uh, and, and if you can just kind of change that. Muslims have to engage in reform, as other uh, religions have, and they do that. I discussed that in the future of Islam. But if we think combating violent extremism is primarily the primary driver of this religion, in most cases it's not. Occasionally it is, but in most cases it's not. Many of the best fighters in ISIL are, in fact, 
Iraqi generals and police who when we invaded, remember when we invaded, part of our policy was in effect to grab, get their guns and fire them all. The worst thing we could have done. Right? Now you've got, you've got a country you want to defend and you don't have an Iraqi army to work with, you have to, to, to build one. Right? Um, we, we need to move away from the idea that it's just going to be the religious side. And, and, and that, that, there's more and more of an attempt to do that. But I can remember being at a panel in Europe where the whole panel, the title of it was, Why Has CDD Failed So Visibly? And, it's, and we're only beginning to realize that it's, it's those political and economic factors. Anybody else? Thanks, Dr. For your presentation, my name is Father Anthony Salim. I'm the pastor here of St. Joseph Church, Maronite Church here in the city. Ah, um, I lived in Lebanon, the first country, of course, from the Maronite Church. Go ahead. <laughs> Could you give us your uh, view on um, recent Christian, Muslim um, interchange in the Vatican? Especially in the Francis. Oh, the exchanges that occur? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, uh, this this, this uh, project, uh, a common word between us and you, okay, uh, which was, if you go up and you look at common word, uh, it's, it's fascinating because the document is supported by copious quotes from the Bible and the Quran. So it's, it's really, it lays out the theological groundwork for saying we live in a dangerous world, but we share things in common, we need to come together, and talks about love of God and love of neighbor. That then led to a delegation of uh, uh, a small group of, of, of major Muslim leaders meeting in the Vatican. It, it, it began under Benedict and is carried through uh, uh, to, to Pope Francis. Um, I think that uh, part of the problem that you have when Pope Benedict came in, it's nothing like the, I met some Italian academics in Rome, they're having coffee, it's the first time we met, and then they said to me, do you know what they call Pope Benedict? They call him a German shepherd. Like, I, I said, that's been in America, you know, for all this time, yeah? If they said to me, do you know what a German shepherd looks like? I was going to say, come to America. Um, but things went south with Pope Benedict. As you, as, you, as you probably know, when he first came in, he did away with the Pontifical Institute for Interreligious Affairs. And the Archbishop, who was really good, got sent to Egypt and taken out of that office. Um, that then got approved towards the end of Benedict's reign and has been much better with, with Francis. Uh, uh, Muslims just, I mean, this is an exaggeration. I don't know all the world's Muslims. But I run into Muslims all, I was just in Morocco, you know, I, I'm all over the Muslim world, but also the U.S. They think the world of Francis and see it as an openness. I think I think Pope Francis has put that out there. I think that the reason why I think Michael Calabria's uh, project is so important is that here you've got a Franciscan place, and, and as we discover what actually happened when Francis met with the Sultan, it becomes the basis for building something, you know, beyond that. And uh, and I see Pope Francis as consistently at different points. You know, the idea that he would go to prison. You know, wash the feet of a, of a Muslim, you know, etc. Uh, and that he sought out these occasions to be to be with Muslims. Whereas under Pope Benedict, for Easter night, he baptized an Egyptian newspaper writer who converted to Catholicism in a big public situation. And in fact, in Italy, the guy lived in a village. He should have been baptized in his village church. So he did that in our Easter. Francis says completely different message. And I think that it's, it's, it's been you know, an incredible, uh, I think it, 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 he's opened up the ability for people to say, this is the way, if you're a Catholic, this is the way the Pope sees things and the way he thinks we should move. And, and I think so much so that, that people don't talk very much about, at least not the people I'm around, uh, about Benedict's legacy in that regard in this area. So I, I, I think that it takes us a, a great way. Because it's important, because we know that the conflicts between Muslims and Christians potentially not only occur in Europe and America, okay, uh, where a lot of the people who engage in Islamophobic rhetoric and messages are in fact religious folk, okay, but it's, it's really effective in the Middle East. You know, uh, and, and, and put Christians often in many areas feeling under siege. Oh, 
My name is Barry Gamm. I'm professor of philosophy here at the Center for Nonviolence, and I want to throw you a softball. Um, why does the U.S., uh, when it wants to combat terrorism, turn for advice to the countries that have the most terrorist attacks instead of the countries that don't? I'm thinking in particular of Congress invited Netanyahu here right after 9-11 to give us advice on how to fight terrorism. In fact, Israel had such a terrible time fighting it. Yeah, um, that's because we tend to privilege certain allies and not others. Why is it that the Obama administration has drawn closer to Saudi Arabia? Uh, and so that they, what they've done is done for what seems our strategic interest. The problem with that is, um, until people in Muslim countries are able to um, develop themselves politically, not just economically, until there is a, a sense of popular sovereignty, freedoms, etc., it's going to be a problem. Okay? With the Arab Spring War, was that possibility, certainly with regard to Tunisia and Egypt. The extent to which we walked away from that, we said, oh, we really don't like what's going on that much, but then we wound up giving aid to Egypt, which is going to be used for military, etc., etc. We're sending the wrong message. To the extent that we're concerned about the Middle East in the future, concerned about Syria, concerned about what's going on in Yemen. But to the extent to which we draw closer to our authoritarian allies because we're going to engage in military activities together, okay, and open that up, we're going to have a problem. And to the extent that we are selling arms sales at an incredible rate, I don't remember this figure, but you should try to Google it. During Obama's administration uh, recently, something like $9 billion in sales the same thing happened in the UK. I, I was uh, testifying in Parliament about the situation vis-a-vis -vis British Muslims. And somebody came up to me after and said, the reason Cameron's moving the way he is is that you know he has contracts from the UAE, these big contracts of buying, you know, planes from Britain, etc. Uh, in doing that, I, you know, it's like saying, I want to improve things, but we're going to keep the same philosophy which says that security, stability comes from security, meaning we support authoritarian regimes. We don't like authoritarian regimes, but we can count on them. You know, the quid pro quo will be that things will be safer as long as we let them <coughs> repress their populations and we don't say anything about it. And I think that's really, you know, where there's an issue. I mean, uh, Dr. Chavez, um, Uh, it is a political season, so I'm going to uh, bring uh, something. I mean, the religion in this country has been education right from the beginning of the revolution. As you mentioned, the Catholic uh, had a hard time with this. The same group of people in the 30s and the 40s that the Jewish people become a new for their family. And now we are dealing with the refugee situation <coughs> from Syria. And so you ask people to follow the patients uh, what your, what do you mean by extreme bad? What they mean, I think, sounds like what we can elaborate is that you shouldn't have anybody coming to their children from grow up here to the home that is in Paris because this is recently happening in the Orlando or So, how do you, you know, counsel the politicians? Because I see Islam as a disruptive or super phenomenon like when you're going to. And this project standard, Arab and Islamic studies, is one of those things which we can educate people, bringing the right to see how Islam is as a matter of religion and how. So when the politicians between a speaker can expose the dangers in the White House and try to legislate or set the policy and how to achieve that, uh, how do Well, I think, I think we're in a funny place. Again, for, for those of you who are younger, um, I mean, really young, my like students, which I say younger, but I'm probably the oldest person here. Who's, who's, who here is old, older than 76? Uh, one person, God bless you. I, I won a dance contest recently. I won a dance contest. I won a dance contest, and I don't dance. My wife's in the car, but that's negative. But your nephew's great, and so they played songs that I like, which is slow songs, but that up. 
And then all of a sudden the guy said, there's a crowd against me, and all those married for five years, please sit down. And then he went 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. And 40 would be the only people pretty much there. And then he went on a couple, I said, I need to speak. And he said, we're going to be here a long time. And he finally got to 50, I guess 50. Came off, because he had ended. He walked up to us and said, how long are you married? He said, 51 years. So I told my other nephews, I've been telling them wait a while to get married and try to go to all these weddings. I said, you've got to do it in the next few years and have the same contest. Because I love winning. <laughs> and if you're married longer than I am, you're not getting invited to the wedding. But I, you know, the younger people, you know, you may not realize, when I got into the profession some 40 years ago, I believe the world would be a better place. You know, we tend to buy into this notion of like Darwinian evolution, but we only apply it, we don't only apply it in terms of, you know, um, as it were biology, etc. We believe that it happens in societies and structurally. When, for example, organizations now say in the last 10 years that you look at the world, uh, democracy is in trouble. We have fewer and fewer, we have more and more uh, uh, countries that are no longer democratic. And I felt that the Arab Israelis would surely be settled in my lifetime. I, I felt things would get better in the Middle East. We look at the Middle East now, it's imploding. You know? and, and, and part of the problem we have in our own country is we're, we're a very conflict, conflict discourse oriented society. You look at the kinds of things that we can say in media that are said on TV, when you look what's put in print that, that can be said, uh, that is outrageous. And when it comes to the other, the immigrant, just, just think of this. We have friends, let's say close friends, who are Nicolai. And I've got other families, close friends, born and raised in Buffalo. Ah, here's a little story. I'll put their name out and then you can all say It's not uncommon here, unlike any time in my life, when a friend, like our friends from Buffalo, who are uh, Italian and Irish, when uh, the Garagio family leaves, and they've had a good time with me, and we say, I'm going to leave I mean, Jesus. When I grew up, even when people were angry, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> Look at my audience. Uh, I'm using the right word. Okay. Um, um, that's all right. Pray for my world, so. Um, but when I was growing up, even though people thought of mafia, and that was insulting, you know, it was like, oh, I'm from Brooklyn, I was from the mafia neighborhood. You never got into it. My, my grandmother was probably illegal. I mean, I, you know, I doubt she didn't speak English, she didn't. But we're now, we feel very free to use that for all the time. You know, so that means that we've got a real thing about, you know, suspicion that if somebody looks Hispanic, there's an issue about whether or not they're legal. You know, and, and legal as, when you get to, the, to the, the Muslim side of things, it gets even more of a problem. And therefore, you wind up with candidates like Cruz before you even get to Trump. The kind of statements that were made in terms of either not letting uh, immigrants in were saying, well, just letting Christian Arabs in. Yeah. Um, <coughs> too big to be me, okay? yeah. So I can't say, but in fact, you know, they're both circumcised, so how are we going to be able to tell the difference? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry that we have to call this evening. <laughs> event to a close. However, for those of you who still have questions that you'd like to ask, those of you within the Bonaventure community, there is another opportunity to do that. That is tomorrow morning at 8.30. Yes, I know. From 8.30 to 9.30, there is a breakfast for the Bonaventure community, for students, faculty, and staff in the University Club above Hickey Dining Hall. You will have that opportunity to speak one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Esposito about your questions and concerns. I thank you for your attendance this evening, for your interest, for your enthusiasm, and most of all, please help me to thank Dr. John Esposito for the